All right, hello. I'm Amr Abdul Rahman. I'm from the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights. And let me again express that I'm really delighted to be here in Hungary and to express my thanks to the hospitality of the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. Actually, the excellent presentations of today, of today morning, gave me kind of clues on how to bridge and connect the concerns that were expressed in these presentations with the challenges of the Egyptian civil society that I'm trying to map out today. And again, I need to stress that actually the similarities between the situation that you guys are facing in, in Hungary and across Europe and between the situation that we have been facing in the last three and a half years since the eruption of the Arab revolutions across, across the region are actually more than I thought at the beginning, and I believe it is more than you guys think at the beginning, and this is what I'm trying to do in, 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 this, in this presentation. The first image that pops up to one's mind uh, uh, about, about the situation of the civil society and human rights activists in the Arab world, that it is kind of a net and a clear-cut divisions between democratic forces on one side including leftists, liberals, Islamists, Muslim Brotherhood, nationalists, and everyone. And on the other side, we have the bad cops. And the bad cops are the army in alliance with the police forces. They are the authoritarians. They are the ones who are conspiracing against the elected governments. They are the ones that staged the coup in order to oust an elected government in the last, in the last summer. If we learned anything in the last three years is that this dichotomy is actually false. And that this dichotomy, it needs to be problematized. It needs to be problematized in light of kind of a social pluralist democratic point of view or a social pluralist democratic perspective. That I'm not trying to make the case for on behalf, on behalf of the army intervention, definitely what happened in the last summer is a bloody, brutal, draconian coup. I'm not going to contest this. I'm not going to dispute this. What I'm going to dispute is that what existed before that coup was not such a democratic, rosy government. Actually, what existed before that coup was equally authoritarian situation that the civil society suffered from that the civil society struggled against and that the civil society drew lessons from. So what I'm going trying to do is that I will try to deal with the three years that as one as one unit and try to map out four major challenges that we faced in these in these in these three years and try to draw some lessons at the very end. These four challenges are the first one, the challenge of the of actually trying to call trying to to be a democratic activist in such a polarized and divided polity. Political polarization without any area of agreement. Second challenge is that, 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 that actually the growing rates of political violence and terrorist attacks and the response of a war in terror. Third is that the, 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 the challenge to build a democratic, a democratic movement from a grassroots level how to outreach, how to reach out to your own natural constituency beyond the, the, the capital and beyond the community of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the human rights organization. And the fourth challenge, of course, is the inadequate, repressive, restrictive, legislative environment and the atrocities by the authorities and, uh, and, and the police. If we can start with the first one about the divided, polarized political policy, I'm not sure if it's still adequate to quote Karl Marx in this, in this, in this context. But I mean, I love a quote by Karl Marx about that. People really make their history. However, the past still weighs on their heads like nightmare. If there's something that can capture the situation uh, uh, of the Egyptian uprising after the ousting of Mubarak at the 11th of February 2011, it is this sentence that the past was actually haunting those who were uh, who actually initiated the democratic uprising in Tahrir Square and the different squares of Egypt. We have youth forces, we have fresh trade unionists, we have new democratic forces calling for change, calling for plural society, calling for social justice, actually challenging that articulation of neoliberal economy and authoritarianism that persisted in Egypt over the last 30 years. However, they, they were in an organization disarray, they didn't have constituency, and they didn't have the ability to be able to shape the policy that actually emerged from this uprising. That's why a democratic uprising led to a polity that is dominated by 
the same authoritarian forces that dominated the public debates in the post-colonial time. Namely, on one hand, secular nationalist, Arab nationalist, and on the other hand, Islamist. Those actually are the ones that dominated the public debates after the democratic uprising of January 2011, not the youthful forces that actually initiated, initiated, initiated the uprising, simply because they were entrenched in their position. For example, Muslim Brotherhood, it's an 80 years old organization. Secular nationalists and Arab nationalists, they are actually embodied in the state apparatus of the, of the Egyptian state that was established in the 50s. That's why we had a, 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 actually a polity that didn't express the democratic aspiration of the people that initiated the uprising itself. And this actually marked the public debates that followed because those guys, they carried over their own question, they carried over their own problematic, and they actually influenced the process of the constitutional design that followed the, the ousting of Mubarak. The post-colonial polity in the 50s and the 60s was basically dominated by the question of identity. It was an identity politics based polity. The question was that how can we engineer a new notion of nationhood and citizenship that is homogeneous, that is seamless, that actually can stand to the Western, to the Western, to the Western colonialism while being informed by the model of the Western, uh, of the Western, of the Western democracy. However, it is actually prone towards a revival a revival of an Egyptian past, a revival of a golden era past, or most notably, a revival of an Islamist past. So we have kind of a construction of identity that is pretty similar to the construction of the identity that we are seeing in Europe now by the right winger, by the right winger populist, or even sometimes by left, by left, by left winger, by left winger populism. Seamless, homogeneous notion of Egyptian people that are defined by their own religion, or that are defined by their own common language, or that are defined simply by ethnicity. And these are the division and the cleavages that actually dominated the polity of Egypt since the 50s till the uprising of 2011, and actually the forces that were up to write the new constitution of the country, they carried over this, this, this notion of identity actually and they colored the process of the constitutional debate with it. To give you an example, there was a constituent assembly that was elected in, 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 in late uh, and actually in mid-2012 in, mid in order to draft a new Egyptian constitution that was supposed to entrench in the, uh, the values and the aspiration of the, of the democratic uprising of 2011. That constituent assembly was dominated by the Islamists, by Muslim Brotherhood and by their allies actually. It has some portion of, of liberal forces and other nationalist, secular or Arab nationalist, Arab nationalist forces. This, this constituent assembly was completely hijacked by the identity, by the identity debate. On one hand, the Islamists saw it as an occasion that they have been waiting for this for so long in order to entrench their own vision about the Egyptian identity in the constitution. More restrictions on their religious freedoms. That was the constitution that was actually adopted in December 2012, by the way. Restrictive clauses on religious freedoms. Restrictive clauses on the freedom of expression as far as it overlaps with the question of religion. Restrictive clauses on gender. And most notably and most dangerously actually entrenching or constitutionalizing the de facto oversight by the Islamic religion establishment over the process of legislation itself. There was a clause in that constitution, December 2012, that entrusts a body that's called the body of the senior religious scholars by a mandate to oversee any legislation that deals with the Islamic Sharia. To give you an idea about the magnitude of the threat, Article number two of the same constitution was saying that the principles of the Islamic Sharia is the main source of legislation, which means in practice that any piece of legislation should be approved by Al-Azhar. This is our Islamic religious establishment. This is the kind of the constitution that was supposed to express a democratic uprising that basically quotes the imagination of the world in, in January 2011. Definitely, there is no resemblance whatsoever between the pluralistic democratic society that this, that this actually uprising was aspiring at and this constitution that was drafted under an Islamist majority. The problem is that the nationalist elements in the same constituent assembly, they didn't actually adopt a liberal democratic position against these, these, these restrictive clauses, quite to the contrary. They basically reinvented the role of the Egyptian army along the lines of the Turkish model. 
So they thought of the Egyptian army as kind of a guardian of the secular, of the secular republic. And that's why they actually advanced some clauses that entrench the privileges and the roles of the army that, for example, insulate the army budget from any kind of civilian oversight that blocked any possibility to, uh, to, to subject the army internal affairs to any kind of, of the civilian oversight because the army now is protecting us from the Islamist encroachment. And the Islamists were so happy to trade off the entrenchment of the, of the army privileges with these, with these clauses on the, on the, on the identity and, and religious freedom. So the problem is that we ended up with two authoritarian forces are supposed to write a constitution that express the aspiration of democratic, of democratic uprising. And we ended up with a constitution that didn't resemble the Turkish constitution and that didn't resemble the Iranian constitution. It actually resembled the Pakistani model whereby the army is in the background and you have different Islamist political forces are competing, are competing for power. In this context of political polarization among different authoritarian right-wingers, political forces, either nationalists or Islamists, there is simply no grounds for the civil society to lobby, no ground for the civil society to outreach. We tried hard at that time to influence and interfere with the process of the constitutional design. We had projects about the reconfiguration of the security sector. It was actually neglected by the two sides of the debate. We had actually projects about how we extend the oversight of the civilians over the affairs of the military, either in the budget or in the armament or in the internal system of appointments, etc., etc. It was completely neglected and dismissed by the two sides of the public debate. Anything about the social economic rights was completely neglected, and that constitution of 2012 was completely silent silent about anything of the economic and social rights, merely rhetoric clauses, simply rhetoric clauses in the second chapter, that is the Bill of Rights. Anything concerning the gender that tries to entrench in and safeguard the women, the women rights was completely neglected by the two sides of the debate, by the two sides of the debate. Anything about the religious freedoms, of course, was completely blocked by the Islamists and also neglected by the nationalists, by the nationalist forces. This means that in the process of the constitutional, of the constitutional designs, for example, the Egyptian civil society, in such a polity, in such a polity that's highly polarized between two authoritarian forces, we were almost running out of allies. The problem was exacerbated by that our own natural allies in the West, in the Western, in the Western democracies, were actually kind of suspicious about our own struggle against the Islamists at that, at that time. I mean, we were warning against the rise of the Islamic populism, but our own warning were basically falling on almost deaf ears. I mean, we were being lectured by the necessity to respect the outcome of a democratic process, and since the Islamists are democratically elected, we have to respect their democratic mandate and actually struggle against their own illiberal, illiberal policy. But the problem with that, the Islamists were not only illiberal, they were also undemocratic. They were also undemocratic. It's not only about, be, about them being democratically elected, but illiberal. They are illiberal and undemocratic. Because when you entrench the oversight of an unelected religious establishment over the local legislation, this is not only a violation of the liberal components of democracy, this is a violation of the very principle of the popular sovereignty itself. And when you entrench in the privileges of the army in exchange to that, this is actually a violation of the principle of the popular sovereignty itself. And this needs, since actually this is kind of a coup against democracy, it needed kind of a street politics and protest that didn't actually channel its own demands through democratic, through democratic channels. And this is something that actually most of the Western diplomats, for example, in Cairo didn't capture. They were still actually captivated by the image of democratic governments. We have to live with that, and then anything can be subject to discussion and public debate. But they didn't estimate the magnitude of the threat of this illiberal democracy and of this right-winger populism. Now, in Europe, when I see that, that reaction and that inertia and that, and that concern and the feeling of being alarmed about the rise of illiberal forces and, 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 and right-wing radical, radical, radical populism, I tell myself, well, we have seen this three years ago, and we didn't see in the Western European capitals anything similar to that. Quite to the contrary, they were, these governments in Tunisia, Libya, and, and Egypt were actually embraced by, by, the Western, by the Western government. We warned it at that time that the outcome of that mobilization would be another right-winger repressive authoritarian military regime. 
we warned the Islamists and we warned some of the our of our Western friends, but also again our warning fallen 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 deaf in deaf ears. After the coup in 2000 in 2013, there was another constituent assembly that was actually selected by by the army at that time, and its own formation was completely reversed. In in, in November 2013, it was swarmed by liberal nationalists uh, and even and even judicial judicial elements. Of course, we had bitter cooperation with those with those guys, but we had bitter cooperation with them on issues of personal freedoms, but not on issues of the military uh, being subjected to civilian oversight, not in the security sector reform, simply because the whole process was broken by, by the army at the end of the day, and it was not, uh, perce it's not, not perceivable that the army would actually uh, accept or impose some constraint upon its own movement. But we ended up with a better uh, anti-discrimination clause, we ended up with, uh, with, uh, with a better uh, equality before law clauses, and some better Gender, gender clauses. The same experience also repeated itself with the first elected, elected legislative council in, in, in January 2012, and that one was dissolved by the Constitutional Court in the summer of 2012. Again, it was very hard to lobby this, this legislative council that was basically, again, dominated by, by the Muslim Brotherhood. All our own uh, suggested legislation for the security sector reform, for bringing military under civilian oversight was, was dismissed at that time because at that time the Islamists were in deep alliance with the interim, with the interim military, military administration. And this brings me, brings me to, the second, to the second point of my, of my presentation. That is, this deep political polarization led to a cycle of political violence and even terrorist operations that started, erupted in, in, in the last summer. That was expected because such a divided polity with, with the absence of any political center, I mean, there was no horizon for a kind of a democratic or peaceful settlement of that, of that, of that, of that, of that conflict. So there was a wave of huge protest, huge demonstrations that actually, due to so many circumstances that I don't want to bother you with, ended up with kind of a military coup in last, in last July that ousted Mohamed Morsi from power, and then a cycle of political violence between the Islamists and between the government ensued. Of course, this is unbalanced. Of course, there is an asymmetry between the political violence of the Islamists and the draconian, repressive, brutal repression by the government. Definitely, there is no comparison here. I mean, this government should be held accountable, should be held accountable in any international fora or even any international criminal, any international criminal fora. I mean, they committed massacres and crimes that are unprecedented in the Egyptian modern history. This is this is this is, should be underlined here, should be underscored here, and I'm not underestimating this at all. However, I mean, in this in this in this context of the uh, uh, of the of the of the of the of the terrorist attacks, especially in, in, in Sinai, the civil society also are, is facing two two major two major two major challenges. The first one is how to fine tune and craft a specific political line that will actually appease to the public that is highly concerned about this wave of the terrorist attack and at the same time condemn the governmental crackdown as the major or the original sin that actually led to the rise of the of these of these terrorist of these terrorist wave of these terrorist cycle this is not an easy thing at all at all and we have many many interesting experiences and many interesting anecdotes for example in the coalition of the civil society that we that we are member in in the egyptian uh, in egypt the egyptian initiative for personal rights we have a very interesting coalition of civil society made of progressive democratic democratic organizations and there was an attack on a security premises in last, in last January, big one in, in the heart of Cairo, in the downtown, that left something like 14 dead body. And we wanted to issue a statement, and that was so difficult to craft that line on how you can condemn such a terrorist attack as a violation of the right of life and as a violation of the personal security of the, of the citizens themselves, because this is kind of an undifferentiating violence, of course, and at the same time trying to condemn the security at the same, at the same time. What's happening in Sinai is, is, is another thing, because there is kind of a secret forgotten war that Egypt actually is immersing itself in, in the peninsula of Sinai. Sinai has become a hotbed for a number of terrorist organizations all over the years, by the way, not under Morsi, all over the years, even under Mubarak. And after the ousting of Morsi, these, 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 these groups started a military insurgency in Sinai in, in, July, in July, August, in the summer of, 2000, of 2013. And the army is actually declaring this area as a war zone, 
even human rights activists are having a very hard time at least to visit these areas. These are kind of surrounded areas, very similar to Waziristan in Pakistan or Torapura in Afghanistan, and very similar tactics and, and, and mechanism by, by the army. And the level of atrocities that are committed by the army at these, at these areas are unprecedented. Again, there's no time, there is no point of bothering you with all, with all the details. But again, here, also fine-tuning that political line between condemning the terrorism and at the same time condemning the army, the army attack is not easy. And the thing is, gets, gets more complicated when we know the fact that we, as an organization, actually were involved in the defense of some of those members of these organizations before, before the revolution. And how can you justify this to the public opinion? Not an, easy, not an easy thing at all, not even inside the human rights community. Not even inside the human rights community. Because in the Egyptian human rights community, we have some organizations that are, I mean, angered and indignated by the level of atrocity that was committed by the Islamist in power, but also with the Islamic discourse that is not necessarily friendly to the civil liberties and, uh, 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 and many others. And this brings me to my third point. My third point is that the three different interim governments that ruled the country since January 2011 till now, all of them actually were hostile to the free activism of the civil society, simply. I mean, they didn't, they didn't see the civil society as a possible ally. They didn't see the civil society, especially the human rights organization, as, as a force that they can cooperate with in order to advance a democratic, a democratic agenda. The first interim, interim administration, that was a military administration. A military administration that was actually approved and embraced by the different political forces that initiated the uprising at that time. It was not so problematic at that time. Those guys inherited kind of a legislative framework that's not friendly at all for, uh, for the civil society. We have the law of 1999, this is how we call it, law 1999, and actually it's pretty similar to the clauses that, that my colleague was talking, was talking about. Controlling the funding via the Ministry of Social Solidarity. Ministry of Social Solidarity has to approve any kind of foreign funding from unregistered firm. An unregistered firm, by the way, include USAID, include Ford Foundation, and, and many others. And when you see Minister, Ministry of Social Solidarity approving the funding, this simply means that the state security agency or intelligence service approving the funding. That's it. And we had many, many incidents in the past before the revolution about funding that's being blocked by for security reason, and this is by law. And the Ministry of Social Solidarity can block the fund for security circumstances, by the way. Ministry of Social Solidarity, it has the right to dissolve the board of any NGO following, following an audit. And the audit actually happens in a, very arbitrary, in a very arbitrary way. And then sometimes before the constitutional amendment of 2014, the Ministry of Social Solidarity even had the right to dissolve that NGO itself. So after establishing the NGO and having the legal status, this legal status could have been completely cancelled, completely erased by an administrative decision from the Ministry of Social Solidarity based on audit. And definitely these audits are completely arbitrary. So all of a sudden, I mean, you will have an auditor coming from the Ministry of Social Solidarity, you don't know why, and definitely biased. And we had, we had kind of a number of organizations that faced these, 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 uh, these situations, like the Egyptian, the Egyptian Legal Aid Association. That was before, before the revolution. And also, the third, the third character of this, of this legislation is also this blurry, ambiguous definition of the political activity and where to draw the line between the activities of the civil society organization and the activity of the political organization. Again, broadening, broadening the term of the political activity to include basically everything. And this gives a leeway for the Ministry of Social Solidarity to intervene and crack down on any NGO following the pretext that it is involved in political activity. This happened again with, for example, Egyptian uh, Center for Trade Union Service in, 2000, in 2007. So these are the three characteristics of that, of that law. Blocking foreign funding, blurry and ambiguous definition of the political, of the political activity, and the third thing that is uh, 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 empowered excessive authorities of the Ministry of Social Solidarity in the audit. One major demand for us after the revolution from the interim government was to amend this legislation. And actually they had the legislative power and they refused. Not only that they refused, they had a copy and they tried to advance a copy of a much more authoritarian and restrictive legislation. 
Yeah, at that time, that military, that military administration was supported by the Muslim Brotherhood. But to be completely fair, this didn't happen. And we managed to block it. And we managed to block it by the assistance of different political forces at that time. The same interim, interim administration actually launched raids and attacks against a number of the civil society organization in January 2000, 2012. And there was that famous case of the attack of the Freedom House. Freedom House it has, a, it has a premises in Cairo. It was raided by, by the police. And the members uh, of, the, of, the, of the office were rounded up, detained nine of them, I'm, I'm not sure, nine or even more, including Egyptians and Americans. And they were facing, uh, they were facing uh, charges of treason, uh, spionage, and uh, 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 actually money laundry, or allowing, or allowing uh, Egyptian entities to, to receive money uh, by the evasion of the, of the Egyptian rules. That was a famous case in January 2011, and it was only sorted out by John McCain coming to Cairo, getting those guys on board, and leaving uh, uh, without waiting for the judicial, without waiting for the judicial, for the judicial procedures. And the Egyptian, and the Egyptian, <laughs> the Egyptian detainees, the Egyptian accused person, are still facing the convictions, by the way. But the Americans, but the Americans left. The raids continued. Uh, actually, this style of raids that is kind of a conventional raids and rounds up by the security completely arbitrary, not following any kind of legislative framework, it continued till now. And before coming here, only one week, only one week ago, there was a raid against one of the premises of the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights in Alexandria, a big one and a big entity. Again, 14 members were detained. However, they were released afterward after being kept in, in detention center for two, for, two, for two days. And then you have this kind of conventional rounds up for civil society activists either being member of NGOs or collaborating with NGOs like students, for example, who are a major source of information for us, or like trade union activists who are a major source of information for us and, uh, uh, and many others. The thing about that, I mean, like the, the, the first military interim administration, the Muslim Brotherhood administration, and the third military interim administration that we are living in, all were held kind of suspicion points of views towards the civil society coming from their own ideological background, again. I mean, the army, it was kind of clear for them to be completely hostile to the civil society, but also the Islamists, they didn't trust the civil society. We were always being accused by the Islamists as non-biased, as bunch of liberals, bunch of leftists who are trying to abuse and manipulate their own position as civil society activists to advance a political agenda. And this political agenda is anti-Islamist, is pro-Western, etc., etc., etc. So the, the propaganda in the media against the civil society didn't stop in the last three and a half, in the last three and a half years for different reasons. I mean, for different reasons and drawing on different ideological, ideological back backgrounds. And this brings me to my final points and the fourth challenge that is facing the Egyptian civil society, that is how to reach to our true constituency. There is a constituency for the human rights activists and democratic activists in this country. Those young people that appeared in Tahrir Square and that appeared in many, in many other squares, where are they? I mean, we have seen a polarized polity, we have seen a war in terror and political violence, we have seen oppressive governments. But where are those guys that ousted two presidents? I mean, this is a question that we needed to, that we needed to address as from the 2011, that we are living in historical moment, and the country is undergoing radical change. And this organization, like the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, and many others, but I'm not talking on their behalf, of course, but we needed to address this organization, how we can reach our own natural constituency. I mean, the things showed very clearly that there is a constituency for human rights in this country, but where? And how we can outreach to them? And this means that we need to actually revisit our own organizational structure in order to be able to reach to this, to this constituency. Our organizational structure that we inherited from the founding fathers of the human rights movement in Egypt, that is an office, bureau, in Cairo, executive director, board, different experts, lawyer researchers, etc., etc. that needed to change dramatically. That needed to change dramatically because we have kind of a reservoir of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of human rights activists that we just need to liaise with. And that's why we decided to expand regionally, that there is no, there is no, there is no use of being confined to Cairo and there is no use of being confined to the desktop research. We need field offices. We need field offices that is, that is, that is basing itself, that is made of volunteers or even members of staff, but their major, their major, their major task 
is to find this constituency, is to build kind of a community of human rights activists across, across the country, a community, a friendly community that a human rights organization can live in. This community, be it in campus, be it in trade union, be it in neighborhood, and whatever. However, this geographical expansion is not merely a logistical issue. It's not an issue of funding, it's not an issue of administration. Because once you start expand geographically, you need to expand thematically. Because in the field, on the grassroots level, there is no Chinese walls among the different packages of rights, between the economic social rights and civil and political rights. Once you're in the field, you will find very complex cases of people, for example, who were trying to find themselves a house, who were occupying empty houses, but they are evicted by the police and they are evicted brutally by the police. This is an economic, social, and rights case, and this is also a civil and political right case related to the freedom of assembly and related to the freedom of, of, of organization, or, I mean the, 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 the freedom of association, but also it's an economic and social case that has to do with the right to housing. The same with health, the same with the environmental rights, for example, and in Egypt, there is an, an, a, very, a very interesting rising environmental struggle against, uh, against uh, uh, Siemens factory, for example, or against nuclear plants west of, west of Alexandria. And the same, you have people from the communities trying to block the establishment or the foundation of that, facing the brutality of the police, cracking down in their own association, and then you will find the border or the boundaries between civil and political rights, economic and social rights, and cultural rights are being transgressed on daily level. And that's why you have to expand thematically. And that's why also you need, if you would like to expand your own mandate all over the country, you have to take on board the economic and social rights as one fundamental issue that any human rights organization in a country like Egypt has to engage with. It is now history whereby a human rights organization in a country like Egypt that faced brutal, slavish, lavish uh, uh, program of economic liberalization over the, 30, over the 30 years can ignore the economic and social rights and say, this is not our piece of cake. Fiction. This doesn't work like this. And that's why we started to establish an economic and social unit inside our own organization. And it is now the biggest, and it is now the most growing, the most growing one. And other organizations started to take on board this issue about the economic and social rights, not only as a new thematic issue, but as the only issue that can give us a leeway to liaise with the grassroots level. If you would like to, to liaise with, the, with your own constituency, you have to engage with the economic and social rights. So in conclusion, again, I mean, I tried, to, I tried to sketch and map out the challenges that we are facing in order to show the similarities between the situation here and in the South. Again, we are facing a rise of illiberal democracy, a rise of illiberal democracy in an Islamic guise and in a nationalist guise by a democratically elected one and by someone who came by a coup. But at the same time, what they share, they share kind of an illiberal democratic aspiration and kind of a radical populist articulation of the identity and of the nationhood itself. And we actually responded along the lines that were suggested by Professor Stephen in the morning, that we responded by not shying away from politics. We actually responded by attempting to build a political coalition. That was, again, a strategic decision that we took in 2011, that it is no longer possible to stay in our office and say, we are human rights activists, we have nothing to do with the politicians. In a country like the one that we were struggling in, again, the boundaries between the political activism and the human rights activism very large, and they need to be transgressed. And the question is not whether we will be part of a political coalition. The question is whether, the question is which political coalition we have to be part of. This is, this is the question. And our own answer that we tried to advance in the last three years is that we need a political coalition that has three characteristics. The first one, it has to be more pluralistic in its own structure, made of political organizations, civil society organizations, and grassroots community organizations as well. Wide front, similar to the, to the, to the experiences of Brazil or Latin, or Latin America, about the social coalition, social political coalition, made of grassroots organization, community organization, and we have very interesting local experiences in this, about how can civil society branches, how can community organizations, and how can some activists from political forces come together, form one front in order to achieve one demand, especially in the area of economic and social rights, and it works. The second characteristic of that, of that, of that, of that political coalition, that it is not a coalition that would trade off 
personal freedom, individual freedom, and the progressive nature of freedom itself form the democratic aspiration. Democracy, in order to deserve its own name, it had to be the framework for the exercise of freedoms. If democracy is devoid from this progressive content, it's basically another form of authoritarianism. It is just, if, if democracy is reduced to the mere procedural character, it's basically another form of, of, of authoritarianism. This is the authoritarianism of the majority or the, or, the, or the tyranny of the majority. So we need a political coalition that is committed to democracy, but that is not ready to trade off personal freedom for democracy. And the third characteristic that we need a political coalition that is committed to economic and social rights, and that is ready to revisit the articulation between market economy and democracy. I mean, market economy and democracy for 30 years in the Middle East, it was represented as the only available horizon for democratic activity. Any democratic struggle, it has to embrace the liberal economy, the liberal market economy. And again, I tried to show in my presentation, if there is anything that we learned in the last three years, that in order, in order, to start a genuine democratic activity, you have to revisit and challenge that dogma. There is no way. These two things are not complementary, quite to the contrary. They are actually in tension with each other, and they are in tension with each other in the Arab world the most. And for a democratic activity to flourish in the Arab world and in Egypt in particular, it has to revisit that dogma, and it has to try to articulate kind of a new social democracy, a new social democracy that is different than the Keynesian social democracy of the West and that's different than the social democracy of the post-colonial government, a new social democracy a la 21st century, a new social democracy of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, of the present. And this social character of democracy, actually, it is basically the puffer zone against the rise of the right-wing populism. Because if you really bring the economic and social rights on board, you are addressing the, 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 the problem of the alienation of the people from the democratic procedure. Yeah? If you are saying that I have a program that is able to alleviate your own, your own social hardships, without sacrificing the democratic mechanism. You are basically winning new allies. You are basically winning new constituency through the democratic cause. But if you are ignoring completely that, 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 that social aspect, you are basically ignoring the roots of the current alienation of the people from the democratic procedure. If you would like to rescue democracy, you have to invest it with a new content. And this new content is not only liberal, it is liberal and social at the same, at, at the same time. So, as you, as, you, as you can see, I mean, there have been attempts to, to envisage how such a kind of political coalition will look, will look like. Very little successes, very, very, very little successes, as you can see. I mean, there was an election, I mean, the election results yesterday are so disappointing. I mean, we have a military general who is now, who led a coup and now is being re-elected by 93% of the votes. 93% of the votes. And if there was anyone that would contend that it would be another Islamist authoritarian. So I mean the successes are very little. But at least after three years of trial and error, we are sure what we are after. And this is what we will be continuing to doing with the assistance of you guys and across the, across the globe. Many thanks again.